Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast. I'm Doug Krisner. You can join Brian Curtis and myself for the stories making news and moving markets in the APAC region. You can subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcast and always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business app. Well, Chinese President Xi Jinping told Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte that no forces can hinder the pace of China's technological advancements. Yet at the same time, he slammed what he considers containment measures by the United States and others. And he slammed technological barriers that have been set. Jenny Morris joins us, Bloomberg team leader for Greater China Eco Government. In some ways, Xi is trying to walk a delicate line here, Jenny. He wants to kind of stick the chest out, be it a little bit saying nothing can stop us. But at the same time, he's very critical of some of these measures from the United States and from the European Union. Is he being successful? It's a very fine line. I mean, it, and it's hard to know how to measure the success. But, you know, if you look at the FDI figures last year, then, you know, uh, it's, it's very tough for them, isn't it? And it's then, two thumbs down there. It's two thumbs down. And in some ways, you know, the people that they've been trying to woo this week at CDF and, you know, other events are some of the companies which are actually in the crosshairs of these very policies. You know, uh, Tim Cook wasn't at the meeting of CEOs with Xi Jinping. But uh, he was in China being sort of wooed by the leadership. And, you know, at the same time, China is restricting, uh, you know, the reports the Chinese government is sort of encouraging government employees not to use iPhones. So welcoming Apple in one way, you know, making life dif- more difficult for them in another. There were reports over the weekend that the, go- the government has said, um, you know, government computers shouldn't have Intel microprocessors, another big American company. So very difficult message for Xi to welcome these people, say the market is open and we're only going to open it more when there are very concrete examples of ways that actually the door is closing. Yeah, it's like the boy that cried wolf, right? I mean, come on in and and see things. Oh, I'm sorry, they're different than what you imagined. And then when he really desperately needs American capital, these companies are just gun shy. I mean, they don't want any part of it. And this idea that there he doesn't see a need for Washington and Beijing to couple. I'm sorry, but that's already underway to some extent. It's underway, and it's a two. It's a two-way process. It isn't just the U.S. that's just trying to sort of, um, you know, de-risk, as they would say. You know, both sides. Like she's been talking for years about sort of dual circulation and making sure that you know China's able to uh, have you know to supply to meet its own needs. Um, so it, it's been a two-track thing for a long time, and the securitization of the relationship is taking place on both sides of the fence. There's some hypocrisy on both sides. Uh, you, you hear strong criticism about uh, industrial subsidies in China by the United States. But now you see the U.S. moving very, very rapidly toward industrialization and providing much of the same subsidies at home. However, I suppose the one difference is that uh, there will be non-U.S. companies that can compete for and perhaps gain those contracts in the U.S. That's right. It's not a, you know, it's never an apples to apples comparison. At the same time, you know, the China, the advantage China has in things like the EV industry is not all down to subsidies, right? They have like a, comp- a very good supply chain. They've developed battery technology. Mm-hmm. Having all of those things sort of in the same country um, also helps China drive down prices. And they're also um, executing a, a lower cost point. You know, they're not making like the high end vehicles a lot of the time. It's all the BID pro- BYD products and so on. So. It's, it's very hard to sort of judge who whose claims are fair and what's protectionism. And it's sort of a very gray area. What's the urgency to solve this problem? I mean, given that what's going on in the Chinese economy right now and she's saying that he needs more American capital at a time when the Treasury secretary is basically, as Brian pointed out, the subsidy issue. She's slamming Beijing for its policy. And she said that she is going to kind of deal with this issue during her next trip. But if there's not resolution, what's happening in the background, the erosion, not only of confidence on the business side, but on the consumer side as well. I mean, China is dealing with perhaps an inflection point in its economic activity. Absolutely. And, you know, if you look at the work report from the NPC um, at the beginning of the month, you know, they are going all in with manufacturing. They're betting the house on manufacturing, you know, new productive forces, high quality development. It's all about developing these high tech industries, which are these high points of contention 
with their biggest trade partners. And the more that relationship with the US and Europe heats up, the more risks there are in being in the Chinese market for foreign companies. So, you know, it's a very hard, uh, it is a very hard balancing act for it, Xi's to get right. Is there a message in that President Xi Jinping and Premier Li Qiang did not go to Boao? They're at home. Now, we had the conflicting schedules. We had the, the development forum and also the visiting CEOs uh, in, in China. So it's perhaps understandable. But is there a sort of underlying message there? They, they do tend to sort of rotate um, who goes to Boao um, each year. So, But, you know, it, Boao has a lot um, more sort of Chinese uh, executives as well. I think she, I mean, the, the message, I think, uh, was that, the big U.S. foreign executives where Xi's attention was this week. And the fact that he chose to sit down with them and it wasn't Li Chang doing that big roundtable as normal, I think was the message for how important this is now and where it sits on his agenda. All right. Well, thanks, Jenny, uh, for joining us here. We're out of time for this segment, but a pleasure as usual. Jenny Marsh, Bloomberg team leader for Greater China EcoGov, with us live in our Hong Kong studio. All right, Eddie, thank you. Let's get to our guest. Margie Patel is with us. She is Senior Portfolio Manager and Multi-Asset Solutions Head at All Spring Global Investment. She joins us from just outside Boston. Margie, it's always a pleasure. I mean, got one more trading day for the uh, in the first quarter. It's hard to believe that in that period, those three months, the S&P is up nearly 10%. Are you expecting this market to continue to march higher? Well, actually, I thought we would chop around in the first half of the year and not really make much headway. So I'm uh, pleasantly surprised that the market is up almost as much as I thought for the full year. But I think, again, we're getting to the the end of the quarter. And once again, we start to see what are the results in the first quarter. And really, I think that, uh, by and large, they're going to continue to surprise on the upside. Uh, the economy is growing. Profit margins look like they're holding. And companies don't seem to be very hurt by um, the Fed having raised interest rates. So we think it's more of the same. Is there a little bit of a chance here to take advantage of institutional rebalancing? Uh, because we've seen, we know that with a 10% gain, a lot of pension funds and other institutional investors will probably have to, in order to get their 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 balance back in according to the mandates uh, of whatever they're managing, that you could see some selling in, in some of these high-flying companies. In fact, we've seen it, AMD down about 15%. NVIDIA has pulled back from, what, 975 or so to around 900. Does that give investors uh, a kind of handy dip to buy? There hasn't been really any hardcore negative news. You just think profit-taking is, is natural, too. Yes. No, I think actually it would be a great opportunity because you would have institutional sellers who are selling not for fundamental reasons, exactly. uh, changing the outlook, but rather simply to rebalance. So it's actually a great opportunity. And I think a lot of the tech stocks have moved so much this year over the last uh, 12 months, too, that they really need a rest. And uh, so I think it's a good time to, to take advantage of any little dip that we have. I think we can agree, though. So much of what the market has done this year has been predicated on this idea that we're going to get massive rate cuts from the Fed. And tonight, we heard from Governor Chris Waller saying, hey, there's no rush to lower interest rates. Uh, and maybe we'll not see the three rate cuts that even the most recent dot plot suggested. Maybe when, when it's all is said and done, it's going to be more like what Rafael Bostic said the other day. And it's one, not three. What do you think? Well, I think what it tells you is the market, frankly, isn't paying all that much attention to what the Fed is saying about one cut, two cut, three cuts. Uh, they're looking at the fundamentals, uh, the outlook for individual companies, the outlook for, you know, sustainable growth in, in several areas. Um, artificial intelligence is just one of them, but that's a huge area. And uh, a quarter point here or there really doesn't change the outlook for, um, for profits. So I think that um, we should expect to see companies maintain their profit margins as they have now for a number of quarters and uh, really not pay too much attention to the Fed, looking more what's the outlook for growth, who gets to keep <clears throat> their status as a high grower, uh, what companies are, are losing uh, relevance and, and uh, not able to uh, maintain their, their, their uh, PEs levels. 
So we've seen a lot of kind of internal measures in the market that suggest that the market has gone too far too fast uh, and that, you know, you could get a correction. You hear from a lot of people thinking, well, you know, we could easily get a correction here. But you can imagine this painful discussion that uh, advisors are having with their clients saying, I don't want you to take part in this 30 percent rally in stocks because we could get a five to eight percent correction. Well, when you think about it, in, in the grand scheme of things, a 5 or 10 percent correction is really pretty mild. And what does the market do after that? Well, it's going to go up. So um, I think that uh, basically a lot of investors, when the Fed began to raise rates, looked at the history books and they said, well, the Fed raises rates. That means we have a recession. That means stocks have a big correction, you know, 20 percent and stay there for a while. None of that happened, really. We had a few little dips and the market's come back and gone even higher. So. Uh, I think it's a, a little bit of wishful thinking to say, oh, the market's too high, PEs are, are too high, stocks have run too fast, the market's too concentrated. Margie, before we let you go, I want to think globally because uh, President Xi Jinping earlier in the day in Beijing uh, was speaking to a group of American business leaders. When you think about the relations between the U.S. and China right now, does, do you allow that to enter into your thinking when making decisions on putting money to work? Well, you know, I, I'm sure he's trying to desperately find any way to uh, keep the Chinese economy growing. It's uh, very, very difficult. And uh, it seems that, of course, he'd love to have American companies come in, share their intellectual property, uh, make investments in China, help the, the Chinese. The question that you could ask yourself is, what do American companies really get out of that? So I think it's good for everybody to be sociable and talk. But uh, I think companies are going to be pretty cautious about committing capital into China, especially with the backdrop of lower growth there. And, and there's some contrasts uh, here. The Chinese President Xi Jinping told the Dutch Prime Minister that no forces can hinder the pace of advancement by China. But then he's at the same time criticizing uh, the moves by the U.S. and Europe to put some constraints on China. So, you know, on, on the one hand, he wants uh, to say, you know, we, we can't be held back. And on the other hand, he says, please don't try to hold us back. How do you make sense of that kind of approach? Well, I think it shows you what all, what's inevitable when you have a, uh, a state-administered economy is whatever strength they had initially, they just run out of gas. And that's what you're seeing in China. It's an economy that has uh, 18% is devoted to housing. Uh, yeah, in the okay. U.S., it's about 5%. We got to go, Margie. Thanks so much, Margie Patel from Allspring Global Investments. This is Bloomberg. We are joined on the program by Joe Matthew, host of Bloomberg Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. We wanted to take a closer look at uh, the latest on the Baltimore Bridge collapse and then also the life of Senator Joe Lieberman. Let's start with Joe Lieberman. Joe, I mean, th this is a, a man who is about as committed to politics as <laughs> anybody you'd ever meet. He was elected to the Connecticut Senate way back in 1970. I think he was just barely out of law school. He's known for being a patriot for being a Democrat turned independent and a stubborn centrist, what will you remember Joe Lieberman uh, for the most? Well, uh, look, all of that is uh, true. And, and I, I look, we're, we're, we're kind of acknowledging the, another moment here with, with the end of an era, the, the generational shift that's happening here in Washington, 82 years old. He's one year older than his former Senate colleague, Joe Biden. And I think that we're remembering the fact that they don't make Democrats like these anymore. Obviously, he did end up an independent, but he was, of course, the vice presidential nominee for his party in 2000. And you go back even further to when he was first elected to the Senate. He was endorsed in that race against Lowell Weicker by William F. Buckley Jr. Can you imagine a world <laughs> wow. in which a Democrat, it's just a different time in politics. Yeah. The gentleman from Connecticut, we talked to him just last week in his, uh, his final role in politics as national co-chair of No Labels. He was determined to get a candidate in this race to have an alternative to Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And he will, of course, not live to see that happen. You're absolutely right about uh, the year 2000, I think it was, when he was tapped by Al Gore to become yeah. uh, the candidate yeah, on the ticket with Mr. Gore. But before that, you'll remember that during the impeachment trial of Bill Clinton in the Senate, 
Lieberman broke with many of his Democratic colleagues and yeah. took to the Senate floor and basically denounced Clinton's behavior as disgraceful and immoral. Do you think that came back to to bite him in a way? Well, I'm not sure. I, I, I think that, you know, he, he stayed that Joe Lieberman. And we have to remind everybody, he almost ran with John McCain uh, on a presidential ticket just a couple of years after that. Think of what changed between 2000 and 2008 for this individual. And he saw it as a party that was changing around him. Of course, he did not end up running with John McCain, but he was more closely associated with the Maverick from uh, Arizona than, say, a liberal from New England. Joe, you know, he was a man that was so committed to his country, but almost in the end, was he a man without a country? Oh, gosh, I don't think he would tell you that. You know, when you think about his speech at the convention in 2000, the first words out of his mouth were, uh, isn't this the greatest country in the world? He was a patriot. You said that in the outset, and I think that's accurate. And he saw us at a point in time in this campaign cycle where he could affect things, hopefully, for the next generation. I asked him when we talked to him last week if he was turning his back on his old friend Joe Biden, and he, he rejected that premise. He really didn't see it that way. He had a lot of respect for Joe Biden, but he doesn't think this country can move forward with an 80 something year old leading it. He's one. He knows who it was. He knows what that's like to have that disconnect with the next generation. It's it's a question now at this point, if no labels will run a candidate or if that, in fact, will be the end of the road on that idea. Well, that's an interesting point. I mean, do you think that Lieberman's spirit kind of looms large over that uh, kind of third party movement? Maybe. Look, it's still a going concern. The problem is they haven't been able to find a candidate. Uh, there have been funding issues. There are ballot issues. They're only on a couple of the ballot in a couple of states here. And the idea that he expressed, by the way, is that the, if this does appear to be a spoiler, which every Democrat will tell you that it is, they would choose to not run a candidate. I'll be curious to see if that spirit lives on with no labels if they do choose to run. Yeah, I was just wondering whether or not, you know, as we look across the spectrum, whether centrists are sort of being run out of town now. Well, look at the, the retirements. We're in excess of 40 now. Uh, this is Republicans and Democrats. You talk about centrists, you're right, but it applies to both parties. And the number of retirements that we have seen folks stepping down, even young men like Mike Gallagher, who chairs the China Select Committee, calling it mm. quits like this because it's not a fun job. They can't get anything done. The vitriol, the threats uh, that they receive just don't make it worth it. They can go make a lot of money and, and do something a lot different. And that's just a different place than Joe Lieberman went to work for in 1989. Joe, in the time that we have left with you, I want to pivot to the uh, Baltimore Bridge collapse. I think that you and your colleague uh, Kaylee Lyons have yeah. been doing fantastic oh, coverage gosh, over the last you. two of Yeah, it's been really uh, beneficial to kind of get at some of the insights that, uh, that you've been able to provide. What do we need to understand right now as to where things are? Boy, there's so much uh, yet to understand. I talked to the Treasury uh, or the Transportation Secretary today. Forgive me, Pete Buttigieg has really been spearheading this uh, for the administration. And it's really about understanding how much we don't know, to be honest. Look, this just a short time ago, uh, you know, started moving away from being a recovery mission. They are still, of course, looking through the harbor. But these are six presumed dead individuals now. And it's going to start becoming time to clear the harbor. When he talked earlier about the first job uh, that needs to be done. It's clearing the harbor and releasing, freeing the 40 ships that are chapped, uh, trapped inside the port. There's a really important meeting tomorrow that Buttigieg is going to hold with uh, with shipping companies and, as he says, supply chain stakeholders, anyone who's involved in this exercise in the port. Guys, they need to find new locations for autos, for coal. They're going to look to New Jersey. They're going to look to where you are, Doug, in New York. They might look down south, but they need a plan right now to try to get these goods into port so prices don't start going up for a whole new reason. I agree with uh, Doug that you've been amazing. And I would say for Kaylee, just sort of amazing squared. Uh, no, no, you're a no notes person, too. But no, no, it's just uh, just absolutely running through everything we know where we're going. You know, we had this news conference um, just a, a short while ago. Jennifer Hlendi, we, we carried some of that. Got a little technical in, in nature. Yeah. Has there been anything really substantial? I mean, what surprised you most about what you learned from that? 
Well, just to the, the extent to which this conversation is happening on board the ship, can you imagine what it's like to board that boat right now and talk to folks who were in the middle of this? They got the black box off the boat. There are a lot of questions, though, about damage underneath the waterline. These divers who are going down there, I can't imagine what they are going through. We also have unmanned submersibles that have been used to try to see the, 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 the bow of this ship is sitting on the floor because the bridge is laying on top of it. You've got hazardous materials. You've got a lot of fuel on board. They need to figure out how they can move this without creating a whole new disaster, in this case, an environmental disaster. And until that happens, you've got 40 ships carrying goods, and they're trying to offload a lot of this stuff. But until they can be taken out of the port, we can't really do a lot uh, with the bridge. Then they will start looking at whether there's anything survivable here or if we're building a bridge from scratch. The number today by Bloomberg is $2 billion for this project. And we're already hearing some pushback in Washington on who is going to pay for it. Well, that will take us full circle back to Joe Lieberman, the spirit of compromise. Do you think that's likely in this event? You know, I don't know, Doug. You you, you tend to think so. Everyone has a stake in having a bridge that works here and keeping the flow of traffic and trade moving. But I keep hearing from folks, including lawmakers. I talked to one from Maryland today, uh, Glenn Ivey, who said, look, this is not 2007 when that bridge collapsed in Minnesota and Congress acted in in the heat of the moment to pass unanimous emergency funding support. We're just not getting along like that right now. And there might be a call to slow things down, maybe have a public private partnership, see if the shipping line has some blame in this game. Look, it's it's really hard to tell. Lawmakers will be back after Easter. And from what we've seen so far, Republicans in the House specifically just don't want to do anything that looks like a win for Joe Biden. Yeah. Joe, great stuff. Thanks so much for joining us. Joe Matthew, host of Bloomberg's Balance of Power. This has been the Bloomberg Daybreak Asia podcast, bringing you the stories making news and moving markets in the Asia Pacific. Visit the Bloomberg podcast channel on YouTube to get more episodes of this and other shows from Bloomberg. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And always on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business App. 